Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're talking about intussusception. As always, let's kick it off with our practice question. A nurse in the emergency department is assessing a 10-month-old infant who presents with intermittent episodes of crying. During the episodes, the infant draws their knees up to the chest and appears inconsolable. In between, they are sleepy and lethargic. The parent reports one episode of vomiting. On assessment, the nurse palpates a sausage-shaped mass in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. So what's the priority nursing action? We have A, administer an oral electrolyte solution to prevent dehydration. B, insert a rectal thermometer to obtain an accurate core temperature. C, notify the provider immediately and prepare for an enema. Or D, administer the prescribed opioid pain medication before further procedures. Okay, say it out loud. Keep your answer in the back of your head and we will circle back to that once we've gone through into susception. Picture the intestines like a long, soft, squishy telescope. You've got the small intestine coming down from the stomach and eventually meeting the large intestine at something called the ileocecal valve. That is basically the junction where the ileum, that end of the small bowel, meets the cecum, the start of the large bowel. Ileocecal, that's where they come together. And normally everything just flows one way, peristalsis, pushes food along pretty much kind of like a slow conveyor belt. In intussusception, a segment of the bowel literally telescopes into the segment next to it. And most commonly, this is the terminal ileum, that end of the small intestine, basically sliding into the cecum. You can imagine it kind of like a telescope collapsing in on itself, one section being swallowed by the next. Now, that inner part is called the intussusceptum, and the outer part is the intussusceptins. But you don't really need to memorize that. What matters is that one part of the bowel got stuck inside the other, and this is a really huge deal because of blood flow and obstruction. So first, blood flow. When the bowel slides inside itself, the mesentery, that tissue that carries the blood vessels, gets dragged along and kinked. At first, venous return is impaired, kind of like a garden hose that is folded in half, that return flow is blocked, and all that venous congestion causes swelling and edema of the bowel wall. So as the swelling worsens, it compresses, and eventually that squooshes down on the arterial supply of blood. When that happens, arteries not bringing blood, we're not getting oxygen, oof, we're getting ischemic. And ischemic tissue gets really irritated, it gets really fragile, it starts to bleed and ooze, and ugh, all of that can just really clog up the bowels. But remember, we've got this bleeding and oozing and there's mucus, and some of that can get passed into the stools, which is gonna be our first telltale sign of intussusception, Currant jelly stools. This comes from the mucus in the blood that is in that unhappy, squeezed up ischemic bowel segment. Now, the second reason we are really worried about intussusception is just straight up obstruction. A telescoping segment gets tighter and tighter, more swollen, and eventually narrows the lumen. So that opening that we have for the stool to pass through is getting smaller and smaller. Intestinal contents can't pass, we have obstruction, and then everything starts to back up. The intestine upstream, so the small intestine here, starts distending and stretching, and then our body responds by cramping down, getting stronger peristaltic contractions to try and force things through. Those powerful contractions lead to the second main symptom of intussusception, which is this severe colicky pain. We are having severe cramping, peristalsis, you know, trying to push food through. Oh, 
That leads to a big sudden pain. The baby screams and draws their legs up to their chest. And once that peristaltic wave passes, that kind of contraction goes down, then they're just exhausted and sleepy, okay? So that's why they go through those periods of colicky pain. That's your second big sign of intussusception. Now, as this obstruction continues, more and more fluid will shift into the bowel lumen and the bowel wall, which can lead to significant dehydration and electrolyte imbalance, especially in our little bitty infants who just don't have that much reserve to begin with. This is where the vomiting starts. Things are backing up, so we got to get it out the other end, and it's going to lead to potentially green bilious vomiting. If at that point we don't do something, we have bowel that is ischemic and we know that can progress to necrosis. It's dying. Tissue doesn't get oxygen. It dies. It becomes necrotic. And necrotic bowel is very friable. It can perforate. If perforation happens, all of our intestinal contents can just spill out into the peritoneal cavity. That's going to lead to peritonitis and possibly sepsis. So, you know, it might seem like it's not that big of a deal to begin with, but if we don't treat it promptly, it really can progress to something life-threatening. So let's kind of walk through a scenario. I have seen intussusception many times working in the pediatric ED. I will say normally I feel like I see it kind of in toddler-ish age, but the kiddo that I remember the most was actually a little bit older. He was, I want to say about four. He came in screaming, crying. He walked into the waiting room, or I should say his mom walked into the waiting room. She was carrying him and they just brought him right back to our little pod, uh, our little pediatric area from triage. They didn't even stop in the triage room to get his vitals because he was just so obviously screaming in pain. And we luckily were not very busy, so they just walked right back. We got him in a room and we started doing all the things. I was assigned to that room I look at him and the most dramatic thing is that he's just screaming in pain. He definitely had that like panicked look in his eyes. His legs were drawn up, but he was definitely from an airway breathing circulation perspective. Okay. You know, he wasn't pale. He had a pulse. He was breathing. He had a patent airway, you know, all those things. So I know we have time to like get history from mom. My friends are putting him up on the monitor and getting their vitals. Okay. Okay. Mom starts telling me he has been having crying spells all afternoon. This was at the start of a night shift. I want to say this is maybe around like 9 p.m. And she's saying that this started after lunch. He ate a normal lunch. He's playing. And then all of a sudden he's screaming. He's pulling his legs up. He's arching his back. I can't get him to calm down. You know, he does this screaming, crying for a few minutes and then he stops. And at first he would like go back to playing, but now he's like falling asleep in her arms and this is going on and on. So this has been at least like five hours or so and she just has no idea why it's happening. But what prompted her to actually come in was that he did vomit. He had a, she described as a green vomit that looked kind of mucusy about an hour ago. And that was what prompted her to call babysitter, get care for her other kids and go ahead and bring him in. Now, he is potty trained as a four-year-old, so I ask her about his stool, wondering if he has had that kind of currant jelly stool that we talked about from the mucus and the blood. But she's like, I didn't look at what he's gone to the bathroom, but like he's potty trained, he's four, I don't know. When I have seen this in younger kids and infants, I have gone and changed the diaper and seen that like mucusy kind of jelly looking stool that comes from that irritation. But with this kiddo, not so much. His overall behavior, though, does really scream into susception, that colicky kind of cyclical pain, him pulling his knees up to his chest, etc. So the other big assessment finding that I want to go ahead and get is palpating his abdomen. 
So I actually do his exam in his mom's arms because that is obviously where he was the most comfortable. I, of course, listened first. He had active bowel sounds, nothing too abnormal there, just on inspection, a little bit distended perhaps, but a lot of kids have kind of a poochy belly. It, it didn't look crazy whatsoever. So going ahead and palpating, it's, you know, soft all the way around, but in the upper right quadrant, I could definitely feel a mass. This is classically described as a sausage-shaped mass, and it's indicative of that telescoped bowel segment. I will tell you that on some of my assessments that turned out to be interception, I could feel this mass, and in some of them, I could not. If you can't feel it, don't rule interception out. But when I was able to feel that in that right upper quadrant, paired with his colicky pain, you know, even though I didn't have the report of those red currant jelly stools, it really looked like an intussusception picture. And my priority here is to go ahead and let the provider know, get them in the room to do their assessment, because what we need to do is try to unintussuscept that's not a real word. That's a Morgan made up word. But untelescope, pull that bowel out. We've got to get it unstuck because the longer it is stuck there, the more ischemic the tissue gets, the more tissue is potentially going to become necrotic. All that bad stuff that we talked about before starts to happen. So we need to address the underlying pathophysiology with our intervention. And that intervention is we need to unstick the bowels, okay? How do we do that? We do it with an enema. I have seen air enema, hydrostatic enema, barium enema. The last facility I was at mainly used barium enema. The concept, though, the important thing for you to remember is enema. We want to do an enema to kind of forcefully cause peristalsis, move something through that bowel, whether it's air, barium, etc. Contrast is another one, a contrast enema. And unstick that bowel. Okay, so I'm letting the provider know. I'm putting him NPO, nothing by mouth, because he might need sedation. He might need surgery. I'm getting an IV to get fluids going. We know he's at risk for dehydration. He's already vomited and he's, you know, not really taking in that much. We're going to go ahead and get some labs. CBC, I want a white count to see if he's potentially got an infection going on. I want to see his electrolytes. We want to assess for anemia. We want to see if there are any of those imbalances. So at least CBC and lights are definitely going to be labs we get while we start that IV and get some fluids going. Of course, I think I already said my nurse friends were putting him on the monitor because we do want to continuously see heart rate, oxygen, et cetera. And then the, as the provider does their assessments, they are most likely going to order an ultrasound. An abdominal ultrasound will help us actually see that bowel. That will let the provider actually diagnose this condition so that we can move forward with definitive treatment with an intussusception is that enema, okay? So we put that enema and hopefully we gently, you know, push through the colon and untelescope that bowel, get it unstuck. During this procedure, it's considered both diagnostic and therapeutic because we're able to actually see the obstruction and fix it right then and there. So it's fantastic if it works. Uh, it, it is reported to be very, very effective. I have seen it go both ways. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it's over to the OR. So another reason why one of our nursing interventions is to put this kiddo NPO. They might need sedated. They might need surgery. If we suspect into susception, go ahead and put them NPO. Luckily for this guy, our little four-year-old here, he is one of the cases where I have seen it be actually successful on the first attempt. It moved really quickly. His pain episodes stopped right away. His abdomen got much softer. We watched his vitals post-op, and we were actually able to discharge him from the ED. He did not need to be admitted. So all in all, a really great save. His parents trusted their instincts. They came in. We got it addressed, and he went home a happy, healthy four-year-old. So all that to say, let's wrap it up, go back to this practice question, and see now if you know what to do and why. Because you, the nurse in the ED, have a 10-month-old who comes in, 
with intermittent episodes of crying. The infant draws their knees up to the chest and is inconsolable, and then between episodes is sleepy and lethargic. On assessment, you palpate a sausage-shaped mass. What's your priority? First and foremost, all of the things in this stem should make you think into susception. Your keywords were those intermittent colicky episodes and the sausage-shaped mass. And if you remember the third key finding for intussusception is that red currant jelly stool. Those are your three classic signs. If you see them in any unplex stem, think intussusception. And what do you do? Your priority action. We had A, administer an oral electrolyte solution to prevent dehydration. B, insert a rectal thermometer to get an accurate core temp. C, notify the provider immediately and prepare for an enema or D, administer the prescribed opioid pain medication. Which of those is your priority? Say it out loud, jot it down, whatever you want. What do you do? If you said C, notify that provider, prepare for the enema, you were correct. This is a classic clinical presentation. Like we said, intermittent pain, red currant jelly stool, and sausage-shaped mass are gonna be your three big signs. And the priority is that we need to reduce the intussusception because that directly addresses the underlying pathophysiology of that telescoped bowel. We have to actually treat, and that is going to be with an enema. So notify your provider. That is your priority. A, giving an oral electrolyte solution is, I mean, preventing dehydration is absolutely important. Don't get me wrong. But oral fluids are not going to be the move here. That oral piece is what made A wrong. Because remember, we have to make this kiddo NPO in case they need sedation or in case they need to go to surgery. So A, oral electrolyte solution, incorrect. Then we had B, inserting a rectal thermometer. I do want a temp. But please, if you suspect an interception, do not put a thermometer up that kiddo's bum, okay? We suspect that that bowel obstruction is causing ischemic and friable mucosa. Any potential rectal manipulation, like a rectal temp, could be harmful. You're going to increase pain, irritate the bowel. In worst case, you could cause a perforation. So if you need a temp, please go oral or axillary or temporal anything but rectal. Okay, so C, totally, totally wrong. And then D, administering the prescribed opioid pain medication. Managing pain, absolutely important. And these kids definitely are hurting. I don't want to minimize this. But if we compare treating pain with treating the underlying physiology that is causing a circulation issue, ABC, circulation is your priority. We've got tissue that's ischemic progressing to necrosis, We need to unstick that bowel and get blood flowing to save that tissue. That will trump pain every single time when we think about prioritization. So that is why C is absolutely correct. Get that kiddo ready for an enema. That's going to be your priority and into susception. Now, your key takeaway here from this episode is this. Remember your classic triad of symptoms and what we do about it. Those three things I want you watching out for are colicky pain, currant jelly stools, and that sausage-shaped mass. If you see any of those in a question stem anywhere, you know intussusception is what you're dealing with, and your treatment is an anima. We need to reduce that telescope bout and get the blood flowing once again. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.